welcome back to the latest episode of Japan's top business interviews. My great pleasure today to have with me a client and also a friend, Lorenzo Scamizzi, who is the president of Capriggiani, Japan. And we are actually in the Gelato University right now, filming from there today. Welcome, Lorenzo. Thank you very much, uh, Greg, and thank you for inviting me. So, Lorenzo, how did you get to Japan? How did you get to become the president here in Japan? Well, I guess my story has uh, many things in common with uh, a lot of people who have been living in Japan for a long time, because actually I arrived here uh, 26 years ago. And uh, at that time, it was for a two-year assignment. It was a specific project, and I was supposed to go back to Italy after that. Uh, then uh, many things happened. Uh, I changed my job. Uh, later, I got married, and uh, uh, I ended up uh, working for Carpigiani since 2002. So this year is my 19th year since uh, I'm working for Carpigiani Japan as a uh, uh, managing director. So what was the original business that brought you to Japan? Well, I'm originally an engineer, and so the company I was working for when I came to Japan was a um, manufacturing company of uh, precision equipment which is meant for the automotive industry. And that's uh, and the reason why I came here was to follow up a specific project uh, related to Japan. And uh, then after that, after the two years, I was supposed to be back in Italy, but then uh, things happened. I changed the job twice, actually. So the first time, it was a kind of a challenge because at that time I was 32 year old and therefore, you know, I was open to any challenge that was available. And definitely when I came here, I was completely struck by Japan, which was completely different from what I expected. It was such a fascinating country to be in. And after two years, I thought I'd just started to learn what Japan was and it was too early to go back. So I decided to switch my job to a completely different uh, industry because I moved to a company which uh, was uh, manufacturing and selling actually accessories. And so what sort of accessories were they? Uh, basically handbags, suitcases, okay. Okay. yes. So and consumer goods? Uh, yes, consumer goods, yes. Mm. When I was offered that job, I was uh, surprised that it was offered to me. But uh, uh, the people said, okay, yeah, well, you, you can do it. It was a startup and it was a completely new company just created. And I was very much enthusiastic about that. Then after two years, there was a change of organization in the company and I joined another company here in Japan. It was a trading company. And uh, at that time, within the trading company, I started to deal with uh, food products. And uh, we were uh, importing especially organic products from Italy and other, other, other countries, but we say mainly Italy. And uh, that was a, quit, a pretty interesting ex experience because it was a trading company. And I have to say that I've learned uh, most of my business skills doing that job in these uh, three years. And then after that, in 2002, I uh, was uh, uh, offered the opportunity to join uh, Carpigiani, which is actually a very well-known company uh, located in my hometown. I'm from Northern Italy, Bologna. And so I've always been knowing Carpigiani for, since I was a child, actually. And it was a very famous, it's a very famous uh, uh, company in Italy. And when I was uh, uh, um, approached for the position, I couldn't even believe it. And uh, therefore, uh, at that specific time, uh, there was a transition where uh, Capigiani Japan was a joint venture company and uh, the headquarter was actually acquiring the company 100%. And uh, therefore, they needed uh, a CEO for the company. And that's why I was uh, hired and that's why I'm here. So in terms of your, your first experiences of leading in Japan, uh, was that you're an engineer on the first occasion, it was a particular project. So you're leading Japanese in the project, I guess. And then you stay on with uh, the uh, accessories company. Did you have a leadership position there? And then the same, when you got to the trading company, did you have a leadership position there? Or was Capriciani really the first major leadership position you had in Japan? leading Japanese in Japan. Let's say that uh, in the previous experiences I have, I had a position of manager, but I was not, of course, at the top, the top of the company. So I would say that I had the experience of managing people, but of course I had uh, an organization above me that was uh, in charge of the company. So what were some of the challenges you found, you know, coming from Italy, come to Japan, you're working in Japan, it's great here, 
you want to stay, but you're still having to lead people in your teams. What were some of the challenges that you found? Well, I think that uh, leading people is, is a huge challenge everywhere in the world, but here you have some uh, peculiar things that you have to take care of. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the, the most important uh, thing, I mean, uh, in Japan for business is to hire the right people, mm. and which is also the most difficult thing to do. Because uh, it happens that sometimes people who are uh, joining a foreign-owned company, they have expectations which are not actually realistic or are not in line with what is the actual reality over there. Uh, so let's say that my first, I think you, you basically learn by mistakes. And my first mistakes I made was in hiring people when I joined the company. Uh, sometimes you got uh, fooled by the fact that someone is speaking in very good English, so you assume that this person is, is, is working well, but it's not the case. And sometimes, on the contrary, you have uh, uh, people who don't speak a word of English, but they are excellent. And, and you don't have to be uh, tempted by going for the first way. You definitely have to go to the, for the second way. Um, then, after uh, you are supposed to recruit the good people, there's another challenge in keeping them. And I would say that there are some peculiar things in Japan uh, to keep the motivation uh, high because uh, engagement is definitely a problem in Japan. Uh, there is a certainly a low level of in engagement in employees on average. Um, what I've learned through my several experiences, even in other companies, is that actually Japanese people, they love to be uh, part of a team and they love to be uh, proud of their own company they're working for which is something that sometimes Western companies do underestimate, right? Because uh, for us, it is a plus, but it's not strictly necessary to work in a company, right? But for them, uh, I mean, feeling this kind of pride in working in a company is definitely an important uh, point, I would say. What were some other challenges? What were some other challenges of leading in Japan? Well, uh, if we move more on the business side, uh, I would say that, first of all, uh, the key word is uh, gaining trust. You need to gain trust from your customers first, but uh, if you are a representative of a foreign company, you need to gain trust also of your headquarters. And both things are not uh, easy, because in the first case, uh, you need to be accepted as a non-Japanese uh, uh, doing business with Japanese companies. And in the first case, you need to gain the trust from your headquarter that uh, needs to think that what you say about business and what you say about the Japanese business culture is definitely reliable, uh, no matter how strange it might sound. And it definitely sounds strange because uh, even uh, through my 26 years in Japan in different company, uh, I never choose to see situation where when you are referring, reporting some things to your headquarters and they are looking at you like, are you sure? Are you crazy? Or something like that. But I guess also, you know, as you said before, uh, they were in a joint venture and you were brought in to run the business after the joint venture was bought out. So they were probably never really seeing the full picture in Japan until you took over and then suddenly they actually see the reality. Yes, I have, I mean, talking specifically about my own experience, I have to say that the transition from a joint venture company to a fully owned company was not at all easy. Uh, and of course, uh, it required to a certain extent also replacing the staff because uh, some of the people uh, in the organization actually did not fully accept the fact that there was uh, a company which was not anymore uh, owned by a Japanese partner. It was owned by a foreign partner and then they were not used at all to having a foreign boss. So I would say that the first two years, two, three years of my experience as CEO in the company has been quite challenging. But I have to say that on the contrary, that was a kind of accelerated learning curve for me to understand uh, how to work as a CEO. And uh, of course, I made mistakes at that time. But what were I made... some of the things that were mistakes that you found? I think, uh oh, looking back, I should have probably done that. What were, th what were some things that came up? Um, well, I, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but let's, let's say that uh, probably um, I, th I thought that, uh, uh, coming back to what I was saying before, that the people working in a company could feel some kind of pride for the company. And actually, uh, it was not uh, happening. And many of them actually were uh, loyal to the previous uh, co-owner of the company. And that was the main reason why they were working there. So uh, that for me was something that I had to uh, overcome and I had underestimated in first place. 
uh, I thought that at the end of the day, employees just needed to feel safe about the fact that there has been continuity in the business and that their position was, was insured. But there was not enough. And that was my, one of my first mistakes I made. Mm. And did you have a lot of turnover as a result? In the first years, yes. Uh, but then, uh, after a while, we, we stabilized our organization. And this was back in 2002. Yes. So at that time, was it difficult to get Japanese to join a foreign company? Because as you say, there's a lot of uh, brand loyalty in Japan to big corporations. The parents are very keen on their kids joining a, a brand name Japanese company. And probably most people didn't know the name of this company and they're going to join this company. So there's a bit of societal pressure to not join a foreign company for a lot of industries. How about in the case of... Yeah, I, I definitely share your view, Greg. Uh, I think that for most of Japanese uh, uh, people who graduate from school or from university, the dream, the expectation is to go to work for a major Japanese company. And that's what they expect and that, that's, that's what families expect from them. It's changing lately, definitely. But at that time, certainly it was like that. And I would say that the path usually is quite different because the people who go for that career path very rarely then move to a foreign company. Usually, uh, you need to find the people who had from a personal experience, even pri on the private side, the uh, opportunity to travel abroad or to have uh, even a, a study period spent in some foreign country, or they might be interested in some part of a foreign culture. Um, being an Italian national, I have some uh, privilege from this point of view because fortunately Japanese people love Italian food, they love uh, Italian fashion, they love Italian soccer. There is a lot of uh, reasons why many Japanese fortunately feel attracted from Italy. But nevertheless, when it comes to the professional point, of course, uh, jumping from a Japanese company to a foreign company is always a challenge for most of employees, I would say. I, I, my memory is that after the Lehman shop, high-end expensive restaurants became less well patronized and in Japan that pretty much meant French cuisine. But this I remember there's a bit of a boom in Italian restaurants. Suddenly there are lots and lots more Italian restaurants because the price point, the taste, the culture, we just hit that right mark at that time. So did you find that as uh, Japan sort of got a bit of a bigger love affair with Italy, uh, and Japanese are going overseas, uh, you know, going to Italy, that there was a market for hiring people who had an interest in Italy to come and work for Capigiani. Yes, yes, that's exactly as you say. I think that the love affair of uh, Japanese consumers with Italy started probably uh, end of the, of the last century, beginning of the 2000s. As you said, it started with restaurants, then uh, it was fashion. I mean, at that time, also fashion companies were booming. Uh, and I have to say that up to today, uh, this uh, love affair has not ended yet, fortunately for us, I would say. Uh, so from this point of view, even on business side, when you visit uh, a, a customer, visit a company and introduce yourself as, in, as uh, an Italian national, uh, we are lucky enough to be mostly welcome, I would say, because uh, unless there is a situation where uh, some people are very, very few, I would say, but they don't really like to interact with foreigners in general. But they say once that the fact that you're a foreigner is accepted, uh, being an Italian is mostly appreciated, fortunately. But you also speak very fluent Japanese, you know. So when you come into a meeting room and yes, okay, you're obviously a foreigner, but then you start speaking in Japanese, I'm sure that must be disarming for a lot of people who are a bit hesitant about dealing with foreigners. They feel, oh, good, I can speak to this person. Have you it is, that experience, it is. Right? Definitely, it is. And I would say that uh, at first place, people, of course, do not expect you to speak Japanese. And if you do, they are really delighted about it. And they feel like a first barrier falling because uh, they, they truly appreciate the fact that the foreigner coming to Japan make effort to learn Japanese. And sometimes uh, some people comment like, oh, it, has been, it must have been so difficult for you to learn Japanese. Actually, it was. But uh, that thing that they appreciate the effort in general, I would say that uh, when you interact with uh, uh, Japanese on a personal level, because uh, as you know very well, the personal relationship in Japan is extremely important. I think that uh, showing yourself as a humble person who is willing to make effort to adapt to the local uh, uh, culture and environment, but without renouncing your own cultural identity, 
Because sometimes I've seen people on the contract, we try to be foreigner who try to be too much uh, Japanese without us succeeding, of course. And I would say that that type of people usually are not that much respected by Japanese. I think that the right approach is uh, being yourself and being extremely respectful and understanding of the Japanese culture. I think in my, at least in my experience, that's what it has worked so far. And what about the difference of, you know, you've, you've come from an Italian business background, European business background, uh, how things are managed there, how people are managed there, and then you come to Japan, so you're managing. What were some of the contrasts in how people get managed in a European environment or in your previous company's environment and how people are managed in Japan? What was the difference between the sort of European model and the Japanese model? What stood out to you as saying, oh, okay, this is quite different? Okay, I would say that, of course, there are some business culture issues related to the uh, differences between, for example, European or Americans uh, or other countries. But uh, I would say that sometimes it's also specific uh, to the country because, for example, uh, Japanese people in, in general like, like to work in a, in a structured and well-organized environment where ev it is clear to everybody what uh, uh, has to be done and who is in charge of something. Uh, sometimes uh, we as Italian, we are not exactly so accurate and precise in an organization and uh, that sometimes uh, has created some, uh, uh, has disoriented some Japanese employees which would expect to have everything framed in a certain uh, uh, situation from organization point of view, from operation point of view. While on the contrary, as you probably know, we Italians tend to be a little bit more individualistic and rely less on organization and on structure and more on the personal initiative. And that sometimes uh, uh, is difficult to understand for Japanese. Of course, once that people start to work for an Italian company, they, they, they get used to it. And probably it would become difficult for them to go back in a Japanese organization. Uh, probably among the foreigners, it might be that uh, for Japanese employees, it's easier to work in a well-structured and well-organized uh, uh, situation, like, for example, like an American company or a German company, where everything is, is actually clearer and more defined. Uh, but I would say that uh, probably the type of people who try to, to join our company, they tend to be a little bit more individualistic than the average. Mm. And so from, from the way that you were managing people perhaps in Italy to the way you had to start managing people in Japan, what were the changes you had to make in your management style? Well, I would say that uh, uh, in Japan uh, uh, there, there are some points in common and some points which are different. Uh, I think that the personal relationship was imp as important in Italy as in Japan. Uh, so you need to be able to connect uh, at the individual level. Uh, for example, in Italy, it's, uh, it's very often uh, the case where you drink a coffee during the, the break with one of your colleagues and just uh, talk maybe about uh, personal matters or soccer or whatever it is. And with Japanese, I would say that this is also important, but it's probably even more important from time to time to have a situation w uh, where you can drink or have a meal together. Uh, and this situation, or sometimes going on business trip together, that is actually pretty much uh, good to establish a good relationship with your staff. When it was possible to travel before the pandemic, I used to go quite often on business trip with my, especially with my sales colleagues. And it was always a good occasion to connect and to, to a deeper level than the daily routine. Because you're eating together. Yes. You're sitting on trains together you know, traveling around Shinkansen or whatever, so there's lots of time for that, isn't it? You somehow, you, you, you share your daily routine, mm -hmm. right, to, to the, up to the, to, to, to the detail mm -hmm. level. So I think that is good in general. Um, of course, that is, is, is important also in Italy, but I think in Japan it is, is extremely important. Mm. And were there any particular things you found uh, difficult? Because you mentioned before that in Italy, there's more of a sense of individual responsibility and, okay, the rules may not be dis defined down to the last degree, but we will make it work. Whereas in Japan, they like that structure. So did you find it frustrating that the Japanese were not prepared to step up and take responsibility, become accountable, step out of that, that little box they're in? Did you, how did you find adjusting to that? Well, I think it can be helped because it's, it's uh, linked to the education system of Japan that uh, basically uh, addresses people in that direction. So it is really difficult to have people uh, coming out of the box in Japan, uh, definitely. I think that one of the things I've learned, which is very important, is that uh, uh, you need to allow people to make mistakes. 
because uh, very often this is not uh, actually accepted within uh, uh, Japanese organization. And uh, this fact of being afraid of making mistakes, it's actually the key of, of everything. Because making mistakes means you have to take responsibility and then the blame is on you. If you live a little bit, uh, you know, uh, easier and without uh, being too much keen on blaming someone if something uh, doesn't go well. And on the contrary, if you allow to a certain extent people to make mistakes, that might create a little bit of encouragement for them to come out and be a little bit more proactive. Yeah, handling mistakes is interesting. Isn't it? Uh, the no defect mentality of Japanese manufacturing, you know? Yes. No defects. Not like in Western culture we might think well, look, we'll accept a 5% defect rate and have to exactly. replace goods because from an economics point of view, that makes more sense than going to a 100% no defect rate with the cost of that. So we will make a practical, pragmatic exchange of defect against cost, but for the Japanese, like, impossible. It's got to be 100% no defect. That's the minimum. Yes. That's the minimum standard. So how, how do you get people to adjust to that? And I guess, you know, do you have this issue with Italy having that we will accept a certain defect rate because of the, the economics of that for a, a Japanese industry where there's no defects accepted? Because your salespeople are the ones who have to go back and apologize if it's not perfect or that type of thing. How, how does that work? Well, I think you have to be, uh, first of all, you have to be honest to a certain extent. And I'm talking about myself, but I'm talking also about our sales team. Uh, he, of course, uh, uh, as a first step, uh, Japanese customers who are willing to challenge uh, uh, having a foreign-made uh, uh, product already know from the very beginning that uh, it, it could be a little bit different from the Japanese-made product. But nevertheless, you need to be extremely careful, of course, uh, uh, to maintain a high level of quality. Um, but at the same time, I think that the, the skill that you need to develop is to somehow to prepare uh, your customers to the fact that uh, things might uh, not work 100% fine. Uh, I mean, put it in, in, a, in a joke, of course, when a Japanese consumer uh, purchases an, an Italian car, it's probably to a certain extent uh, he or she is probably expecting that the car at, to a certain level might, might be breaking. And probably the, the level of understanding would be different uh, rather than when you buy a, a Japanese-made car. Once that you say that, uh, the important thing, if something happens, is uh, action. You have to be uh, fast, you have to be precise, you have to be reliable, and you need to make uh, your customer understand that you are caring for them and uh, that you will solve the problem that has happened. That is absolutely mandatory for a, a company doing business in Japan. If you don't do that, the big risk is that you lose the trust. Sorry, the big risk is what? Is that you lose the trust. Oh, lose the trust. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of that too is, I mean, often people say uh, about salespeople that uh, they often think their own salespeople are actually working for the client and the client's interests more than the employer's interests. So how do you find that with your experience of leading in Japan? Have you come across this issue of, it's great that they're really customer focused, but there's a limit, you know, do you, how do you find that dilemma? Okay. Yes, I, I agree with you that uh, many uh, sales representatives in Japan tend to be 100% on the customer side. Uh, of course, uh, there is a good thing in the fact that the sales representative is supportive and sympathetic to customer positions, so you don't have to discourage that. But the important thing is that you pose some kind of limits when it comes, for example, to uh, prices or conditions. Uh, okay, for example, if you take a discount, uh, endless and unlimited discount would be the dream for the salespeople. And of course, you have to, put, to pose a limit on that. And then also when a customer re requests anything, and basically any request of a customer is a must. And unfortunately, not often you are able to fulfill that kind of request. It is extremely important uh, from a managing point of view that you maintain a balance. And you show yourself being understanding of what the customer is willing to obtain. But at the same time, you have to remind people to respect which are the limits that you, uh, as a company, have to respect in order to maintain the business. Particularly with uh, international business, right? So your headquarters is back in Bologna, I guess? Bologna. Yes, it is. And so 
you're sitting in here in Japan as a Japanese employee of the firm. You're dealing with the clients. And clients want things. And, uh, you know, you represent the client's interests, so you expect your company in Italy to adjust things so that client will be happy. But that company back in Italy is dealing with the entire world, and uh, they're not so keen to make that adjustment. So sometimes I guess this must create a little bit of tension between the head office and how they understand the needs of the client in Japan and the people working in the Japanese operation. Have you discovered that, and what do you do about it? Yes, of course, this is uh, uh, an existing uh, uh, matter that has to be dealt with. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, sometimes when you just report the request from the customer to your headquarters, they look at you like, uh, oh, are you sure, or are you crazy, or something like that. Uh, but I would say that the key thing is uh, educating your headquarters to a certain extent. And uh, for this purpose, for example, I personally don't mind uh, sometimes putting directly in touch our headquarters with the Japanese customers. Uh, when it was possible to, to travel before, for example, I uh, encouraged uh, our people from the headquarters coming to Japan and going together to visit customer and establish the face-to-face -face contact, which is also important for, for clients because uh, it's part of a total trust towards your company. They can see also the face of the people who are working in the headquarters, including engineers or even top management. That is very important, and I think it works well because it raises a, a certain level of awareness and sensitivity on both sides. So uh, on customer side, they understand and they realize that no matter how effort you do, but you need to bring the headquarters on your side. And on the headquarters side, they realize sometimes how challenging it is to deal with Japanese customers. So that is basically the way I, I try to do. Have you found sort of reversing the engineering of this, you know, because of this no defect culture, very consumer customer focused culture here, that there are things demanded in Japan that the headquarters may not have thought about. And they then realize that, okay, yes, this is an expense of investment to retool or to make this adjustment or to introduce some functionality. But that hint from the Japanese market gives the company an incredibly good differentiation compared to competitors in other countries around the world. That The things that the Japanese demand give you something which is almost like a weapon to use against your rivals in, in other markets because you've now been forced to sort of lift your standard higher and the gap from the other competitors gets bigger and bigger. Has that ever happened? It does, it does. Mm. I, uh, I would make no mistake in saying that actually even when you are developing a product, uh, being able to gather, understand and uh, fulfill to a certain extent that the needs coming from the Japanese market uh, is a key of success for the product itself uh, in other markets as well. It is often believed that, uh, especially for manufacturing products, what is good for Japan is, is probably good for most of the other countries uh, in all other parts of the world. And I would tend to agree with that view, especially when we talk about, I mean, in our case, we are talking about machinery, equipment, uh, uh, the level of detail, the, the level of attention, and uh, the level of uh, need that ca Japanese customers have is probably uh, as no matches in any other country in the world. So if you are able to satisfy that, then what you gain is that you already have something which is ready and very reliable and good to be marketed in any other country in the world. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Well, I personally love going to Italy. And things I like about Italy is the continuity. Like you might go to a boutique and go back five years or 10 years later, and the same people you met are still in the boutique working there. Or you go to an artisan workshop or someone selling something that's made by hand, 
and they're still there, you know, 10, 20, like the next generation's taken over. And there's that artisan concept in Italy and pride in that artisan workmanship, which also I think is very representative of Japan. They still have that very strong, oh, so many generations, oh, that's remarkable, that's a good thing. And the same people still doing it decade after decade, that's a good thing. And family business, that's a good thing. The artisan pride and great craftsmanship, good thing. So I see there's a lot of similarities, I feel, between the Italian mentality around that and the Japanese mentality. So do you find that is also a help in having those sorts of meeting of the minds conversations between the Italian side and the Japanese side? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, I think that, uh, that when we talk about craftsmanship, uh, definitely uh, the uh, level of attention and the level of interest on in both countries is very high. And uh, I would say that we share probably also some kind of tradition, probably in different areas, but I mean, uh, the, the tradition is there. And I have also to say that sometimes one of the key on the contrary of success is when you come up with a original or a unique technology and the unique way of solving problems. I think that is pretty much admired by Japanese customers. So Japanese customers appreciate craftsmanship, appreciate design and uh, appreciate creativity, which is probably something that is a little bit lacking in this country because of what we were saying before. Uh, it is not actually uh, a given thing because I've met actually some creative people here in Japan. But as I saw, as I said before, probably it's the education that do not encourage creativity in Japan. But on the contrary, Japanese people appreciate that. And when you come up with a very original solution and a very, very original type of technology, they, they truly admire that. Actually, I want to talk about innovation in a moment because one of the precursors of innovation is engagement. You know, if I'm not really caring that much, then I don't care about making improvements. You know, if I don't care, I don't care about improvements either. So you talked before about the struggle of, of getting people more engaged. What is driving that engagement issue, do you think, in Japan? I think that uh, there are li different levels of engagement. We, first of all, when, what I mentioned before was the engagement uh, to, the, to the company uh, itself. When we talk about engagement in uh, being a little bit more creative uh, or being a little bit outside the box, uh, this is more complicated because it, really, uh, it is really linked with the personal character and individuality of the person that is in front of you. Uh, I would say that uh, I tend uh, in our organization to hire people with, who have some sense of individuality because, of course, depending on the position and depending on the role, but definitely, for example, for the sales team, you definitely need people who have a certain individuality, who have uh, also a certain amount of creativity. Of course, they need to be professional in interacting with the customer, but they need also to have ideas about how to conduct the business. And I would say that fortunately so far, I've been quite uh, lucky in finding uh, this type of people. But it's not granted, it's not a given. I mean, you really need to, I think it goes back to the, to the recruitment process. I mean, because you can't, of course, change people. So you need to select a certain type of person who has that kind of uh, talent already. I've been in big organizations in Japan over many years. And so invariably they go through you know, either uh, engagement surveys or staff satisfaction surveys or whatever. And you'd find yourself sitting in either Singapore or Hong Kong or somewhere where the hub office is located for APAC and uh, up go the numbers for the world and then Asia, APAC and then Japan, you know. And Japan would always be at the bottom of the engagement surveys every single time, you know. And so they're always looking at you like, what's wrong with you, you know? You're obviously not doing a good job leading over there. The engagement's not high. You're obviously not up to the mark. We'd better replace you or something like that. You always feel that pressure to get the engagement scores up. But it's not very easy to get those scores up. And uh, it, I think there's also, I always feel too that the questions have got a certain cultural bias in them that makes it hard for Japanese to score highly because it's a sort of one-size-fits-all survey for the world. And that's one part. And the other part is the scale. You know, if, if you give Japanese a one to five scale, they'll all pick three. They love to be in the middle, you know, and either too hot or too cold, right? Uh, so you've got to give them a scale like seven. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so they've got to make a decision, <laughs> right? If it's 10, they'll pick five. Uh, so how have you, 
you know, how do you know about engagement here in the company? How do you measure that? How do you sense is it getting better? How do you, how do you track that? Well, I would say that we do not have uh, a systematic uh, method for uh, checking the level of engagement in our employees uh, as probably many big companies have. But we do have uh, a yearly assessment uh, process uh, at the end of the year uh, where we conduct interviews. And uh, those interviews uh, have different steps. And I'm also personally involved. Fortunately, we are still a small organization, and therefore I can uh, interview basically uh, every employee in our organization. And it is extremely important uh, to understand their level of engagement, but also to listen to them. Actually, uh, I have to say that uh, when I conduct these interviews, uh, it is always a source of ideas for new business development because just listen to the voice sometimes of a person who is struggling every day with a problem related to his or her job and then it comes up okay maybe we should do this or maybe we should do something different and on that occasion I have to say that some I would say the majority of employees also do some uh, comments they make comments they end it then they make also proposals so let's say in our case this is probably the system that uh, we have to check the level of engagement of the employees. How many, how many people do you have working here in Japan? We have 30 people. 30 people, right? Yeah. So 30 people is doable. You can actually get a chance to talk to, I guess you talk to all 30, is that the idea? Yes. All 30, right? One, one. Well, that's great. You can do that. If it's of three, course, you can't do it with 300. 300 people. <laughs> is going to be a bit trickier, isn't it? Yeah, you start getting scale issues there. And, you know, the I don't know about the... Uh, you know, listening to people, yeah, that's good. Are there any other things you do to try and raise the, the level of engagement? You talked before about allowing some freedom to fail, uh, not punishing mistakes severely like they do in Japanese companies, very severely, uh, to allow people to learn, to grow. Are there any other things you do to try and get the engagement up? Because you said at the beginning, engagement is a problem. And I would add the word still. So, you know, why is it still a problem? Well, uh, it's a never-ending problem. I mean, I, I would lie if I tell you that I've solved the problem entirely. I don't. And of course, even in our organization, we have uh, some employees which are less engaged than other ones. And uh, I think that uh, you have to try your best. First of all, uh, my personal belief is that uh, you need to build an organization around the people that are being built an organization, people around the organization. That meaning that if I found an employee which has a certain talent, I think it is worth to try to adjust his or her role in order to fit the, the talent to the extent to which you can do it. Of course, we are a small organization. We don't have endless capability from this point of view. So I would say that from my point of view, uh, being flexible on the organization is another way of trying to uh, give more space for individual employees to let their uh, talent out. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. But I think it is important, to, first of all, to understand exactly who is the person in front of you and uh, if this person has talents or as on the contrary, weak points. And I think you need to balance the role to, to the extent to which it is possible for you to do it in order to, of course, get the best possible results from the talent and minimize the impact of the weak points. So someone may be hired for one particular position, but after they're working for a while, you start to realize they actually can't do that job sufficiently well, really. But they've got abilities. So you, what you're saying is you're trying to massage maybe across to a different type of role where those abilities can, can work for them. And maybe you need someone else with a different skill set that actually suits that purpose. Is that the idea? It's trying to exactly. yes. bridge yes. across that, that's a little idea. bit. That's yeah. the idea. Okay. And what about innovation? Like, oh, I agree with you. Uh, people often say that oh, the Japanese are only good at copying. And they are very good at copying. They're genius at copying things. No question about that because they're very micro detail oriented, I found, and so copying things they're very good at. But also, if they have the right structure, they can be very innovative and very creative. So how do you get your people to be creative? How do you get them away from that, uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down, fear of stepping out with ideas? How do you get them away from uh, 
worrying about being criticized for an idea, how to get them away from worrying about, oh, if something goes wrong, I'm going to get all the blame and get fired. I don't want to step out. How do you get them away from all of that societal pressure to then think about innovation, think about creativity? How does that work? Well, uh, what we try to do sometimes, uh, uh, wherever, whenever it's possible, is to create, uh, for example, small projects, which mean that uh, the employee is uh, uh, challenged to move in a completely new territory and try to do something new, which is not does not belong to the standard procedures of the company. It is uh, easier to do it for sales staff, of course, sales, marketing in general, a little bit more challenging for an uh, engineer. But I would say that the important thing is that if someone tried to enter a new uh, area, a new territory, which is still uh, untouched and try to do something, then you ask this person, please try to do it. And as we said before, don't blame for failure. If it doesn't work well, you don't have to blame. Okay, you, you tried, you did your best. And maybe through uh, adjustments, maybe you can get closer to the results. I think that is the best way of doing that because the difficult thing is that when you have people perfectly inserted within an organizational frame, it is very, very complicated to get creativity out of it. Because at the end of the day, what makes a big difference is also the relationship issue. Relationship with your boss, relationship with your coworkers. And sometimes uh, I found situation in our organization, but even outside of organization, where people do or don't do things, not because they don't think it is right or not right to do that, but because uh, of the relationship issue. And that it comes to the issue of the consensus. So the problem in, in this uh, country is that very often in business, you have to, uh, I mean, if you don't achieve consensus, it's very difficult for you to move on in decision. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this reason, I think that that is limiting a lot of the decision process and it's limiting a lot also the ability of uh, uh, every single employee to move in paths which are different from, from the standard one. Yeah, mistake handling is is... I don't think done particularly well in Japanese companies. There's a lot of yelling and scolding and, uh, you know, your name goes down in the black book of bad behavior and that's going to come back and haunt you later. So people are very hesitant to, to step up. Uh, and what about where you, uh, you have mistakes made and then people hide them? When I was working in banking, it's a very highly regulated industry with lots of uh, over overview by the uh, FSA, the Financial Services Agency. Uh, lots of regulation and lots of compliance around process. And so what would happen is that uh, salespeople particularly would not follow a process and they would hide the fact that they skipped a process, thinking that if they raise it to the attention of their boss, they're going to be in trouble. So they'd hide it. The trouble is with that industry, you can't hide it forever. Uh, when you talk about money, right? When you yes. talk about money, it's like they, they stick it in the drawer and hide it, but then it starts to grow and you know, starts to blast out of the drawer. And then suddenly what was a relatively small problem, which would have had you know, sort of slap on the wrist punishment, becomes a big problem of them hiding it and that gets them fired. So how do you encourage people not to get it to that stage where it's going to blow up their career or as the boss, nobody likes surprises as the boss because we have the money, we have the authority, we have the power to fix things and if we know about it, we can fix it early. But by the time we get to find out about it, it's usually too late and nothing can be done, you know, it's just a disaster. So how do you encourage people to have some trust in you that they can bring a problem to you that they've not followed a process, have not been compliant or not done what they should have done and know that they can do that without being axed or, or you know, the chop coming down on their neck pretty quickly? How does, how does that work? How do you balance that out against the compliance requirements of the company? 
Well, I would say that there is no uh, 100% uh, safe recipe for that. But uh, what I try to do is to encourage as much as possible the exchange of information. And through a, a system of exchanging information, which is meetings and reportings, then you create, a, uh, let's say, a safety net, which allows you to understand if something goes wrong. And uh, it, it doesn't always work. But I think it's at least a way to minimize the impact. Because as you say, and I, and I definitely agree with you, one of the worst things that can happen, a mistake happen, then it is buried somewhere, and then it becomes bigger, 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 and then uh, all of a sudden it blows up, right? I think that all of us have been uh, experiencing this kind of situation. So in order to avoid that, it is important to create a situation where people is allowed to talk and when there is an exchange of information and uh, and creating also a reporting system. I don't say it's perfect. Still we have, of course, many of the cases that you're mentioning about. But at least uh, I would say that it is more difficult to conceal or to hide a problem for a long time by acting in this way. At least this is my personal experience. Mm. Yeah, I, I've uh, always telling my, my team, you know, if I say something incorrect in Japanese, please tell me. In in the 10 years I've been with this team, no one <laughs> ever tells the boss uh, his Japanese is a mistake. So you keep repeating the same mistake all the time because no one ever corrects you. So, you know, uh, people are hesitant to, uh, to help, you know, uh, help us in that sense. But also, I think hesitant to raise problems with us and... I think I always feel like Japanese, like ninja, in disguising and hiding stuff. And if it's not too big a problem, there's the boss. You're definitely the last person to find out something went wrong. You know, so that's always a fear. I'd rather know early and try and you know not not scold or blame or sack people, but I'd rather know and then fix it. And I'd appreciate knowing early rather than knowing later. You know, but it's difficult. Get Japanese to own up and tell you that sort of stuff I've found. Yes, you're right. I mean, let's say that uh, it doesn't come natural for Japanese staff to go to their boss and say, look, well, I made a mistake or you have made a mistake. That yeah. is always something that is difficult to happen. Sometimes it is also due to uh, some good reason. For example, sometimes they just believe that they don't want to create trouble to you or they want to make you feel uncomfortable or something like that. So it's not necessary for a bad purpose that they are doing that. But uh, at the end of the day, if you are, are not uh, uh, careful enough uh, about what is, is going on, I mean, it might happen, then things happen and, and you're never going to know. So I think that, again, you need to maintain to a certain level your, your antennas and uh, your alarm level quite, I mean, sensitive to what is, is happening around. Talking to people sometimes is good. I mean, just casual talk, because through that you maybe understand something that is going on in the company. Uh, what I would say, uh, intelligence, right? I mean, use some internal intelligence, but not in a, in a bad way. I mean, just to, to be aware of what is going on and to be aware if there is something. Sometimes it could be good, good up to looking people in the face because sometimes you feel someone with a trouble face and then maybe you go to his or her boss and say, well, hey, what's going on? And then maybe you find out something that has happened. So I think that uh, what we must not do is to relax and say, okay, let's, let's go to the daily routine, everything goes well, and uh, keep always the antenna up and looking around, try to understand what's going on, and try to talk to people as much as you can. I think that's the only way that we do have. Mm, yeah. And, you know, I don't know about your team. We're at uh, COVID-19 social distancing here with this video today. Uh, but... I, are all of your team in the office? Are some working at home? What's how's it working? Uh, in current situation, we have uh, uh, I mean people working at home. We we are working in shifts. Well, would say that the salespeople basically they don't need to come to the office unless there is any specific meetings, which by by the way can be done also remotely. Uh, our engineers as well uh, they very often outside. So we do shifts for the office staff, some people. Uh, we still do need to come to the office because uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, detailed operation, as you know very well, paper and everything and faxes and, uh, and hunkers and all these kind of things, which I don't think easily, will easily disappear in a short time. But uh, I would say that uh, as of today, probably certainly more than half of the staff is, is, is out of the company. So all those things we talked about before about talking to people, you know, finding out if everything's okay, 
uh, building that communication, you know, when people are not around. How have you found, okay, now we're in COVID-19, like we've been working at home since February last year. So next month will be a year of this, right? And I've found that as a leader, it's much harder on me to coordinate across the team than before and also to really have a sense of one-on-ones with people because it's hard to catch them often. I'm busy, you know, it's by screen. How have you found this issue of leading people in COVID? Have these things come up in that situation for you that have been difficult? Yes, it is complicated, definitely. Um, I remember when we started uh, the uh, smart working uh, uh, during the first emergency in, uh, in April, uh, it was a bit of a shock for our staff and uh, they were not used to it. Uh, some of them were even uncomfortable about that. So what uh, I did and what we tried to do together with our HR department, uh, uh, on a regular basis, we were interviewing people and understanding from them if there is anything to be uh, improved or, or if they were uncomfortable, uncomfortable with some uh, uh, issue related to the smart working. And actually we found out a few things. So for example, well, uh, working at home for Japanese uh, people is not easy. Uh, mm-hmm. If you are, for example, uh, a member of, of a family and you live in a, in a very small and narrow apartment and probably wife uh, and uh, husband and children are at home at the very same time, it is quite of a challenge. And uh, many of our staff told us that this is, this is actually a problem. Uh, then you have exactly the, the opposite issue. Maybe some uh, single people who are living by themselves, and if they are at home, they don't meet anybody, uh, and uh, they feel uncomfortable and probably lonely because of that reason. So it's uh, not it's not easy. I think that, again, uh, the most important thing is to try as much as possible to create the occasion to talk and to communicate, sometimes remotely or sometimes in person when you can. In our organization, people at least once a week comes to the, to the company. We don't have a situation of people working indefinitely, remotely. Uh, we have meetings, we have uh, schedules. So we just try to work on shifts in order to avoid uh, uh, all people coming to the company at once. But we still have occasions where we meet and so we can talk in person even in the company. Yeah, you talked before about trust. Uh, trust with the customers, uh, trust with the headquarters. There's also the issue of trust with the people. How do you build trust with your staff? I think that in order to build trust with your staff, uh, uh, first of all, you need to be consistent. Uh, you need to, uh, to do what you say uh, and uh, you need to be consistent in different situations. You must show people that you're not particularly favoring someone uh, instead of another one. Um, I think that as a boss, you have a big responsibility here and uh, you must be trusted and you must make the utmost effort to, to achieve that result. It's not easy. But I think in my opinion, I think the most important thing is consistency. I mean, to show people that uh, they can expect from you certain things under certain circumstances in good and bad. I mean, because sometimes, uh, unfortunately, as a boss, you have to be a little bit uh, strict in certain situations. Uh, and uh, therefore, people, if people know and they, they know it in advance, then I think, think uh, that, peop- that things go smooth, definitely. So, in my opinion, uh, yes, I would say definitely uh, consistency is, is, is the most important uh, point in the company with your organization. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. So here we are in COVID where you're not getting on a Shinkansen and visiting clients together with your salespeople like you were before. Uh, You're not seeing them every day in the office like you did before. So how how are you adjusting to the trust building in this very, very different working environment we find ourselves in now? 
you know, having meals together, you know, the whole team has a, a, a end of year party, Boninkai, or a New Year's party, you know, Shininkai, they're all gone. Yes. You know, that whole social aspect uh, that was existing naturally inside the walls of the office, you know, and people coming and going and chatting and, you know, that thing you talked about before, it's all sort of gone now in a way. So how do you, how do you compensate for that to build a, the trust when it's not the same as it was before? It's not easy to compensate. I think uh, you need to dedicate, and definitely it's difficult to have multiple meetings with people as uh, probably you were doing before. And uh, then you need uh, uh, to increase the time that you spend uh, talking to people one by one and uh, create also the, the proper time and the proper occasion you know, that is to happen. Uh, the burden is, uh, is higher than before, and uh, the result is lower because before, as you said, probably with a, a Shin and Kai dinner, you were achieving at the same time a lot of objectives, and maybe you were just uh, going around in tables and drinking with the people and uh, exchange a laugh, and that was a good thing. Today, you can't do it anymore, and therefore, you need to work really one by one and try to create the occasion which it, uh, each one of them uh, to have uh, meetings where, of course, you, you talk about business. But you also want to talk about other things because it's important to feel that the personal relationship is still there. I think that is most important. But it's difficult. I have to admit it's extremely complicated in this period. Do you have any formal mechanisms to that? For example, in our case, before COVID, we had 9 o'clock every morning, what we call the daily dale. We went through vision, mission, values, uh, mantra, uh, what's happening today, top priorities for people. That it was a set piece. And when we went home, we just brought that online. So that's continued right through. So every day, everyone's on camera at 9 o'clock. So if you're not there, it's because you've got something else on. But if people come on but they don't come on camera, that's a bit of a warning signal. Are they becoming depressed? You know, are they sort of, if they're not coming, that's another dangerous signal about depression. We're, we're worried about that. We, we make sure that's not the problem. But there was that glue. And also we had at 3 o'clock a coffee time with Dale. And this is just to recreate the coffee scene, you know, uh, coffee clutch uh, type of thing where you could just come on for half an hour and just chit-chat and have that for those people who are lonely, I'd like to have some human touch to have that. So we've had both of those going for a year. Have you done any things like that here, adopted anything like that? No, we, we do not have created so far, let's say, socializing event online, as I know other companies are doing. Um, one of the difficulties in doing there is that uh, all our uh, people, especially the sales team and, and engineers team, has very busy schedules and it's difficult to... Uh, that was happening actually before the COVID as well. So that's why, for example, in our company, we have the uh, habit of holding the Monday morning meetings, which is the occasion where people know that basically Monday morning, uh, you are in the office or now not anymore, maybe you are remote and anyway to have to connect to attend some kind of meeting. That was the appointment where people felt that they have to connect to each other. We, well, we, we haven't tried yet. It's probably a good idea and it's probably something that we must be uh, considered doing from now on. Yeah, I've actually personally I've found it's, it's really kept the team together. It's worked extremely well. You know, we, we talked about a lot of things, Renzo, so far. Is there anything regarding leading in Japan that I haven't asked you about, which I should have? Uh, well, we have been through quite, uh, quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of issues. I think we cover many of them. Um, no, I don't particularly. I mean, uh, if we just move a little bit outside of, of your own company organization, I think that uh, it is important also uh, the part related with the relationship of the, of the, with the customers. I think it is extremely important uh, uh, in Japan and probably not only for a foreign company, for any company. Uh, sometimes your salespeople, they visit customers on a daily basis. Sometimes they face challenges. And I think uh, uh, supporting them and visiting them, then, for example, in that occasion, sometimes they can... Uh, access to a little bit of higher level management in the, in the client organization, which uh, probably not always happen when they're visited by themselves. So I think that uh, uh, this is also a way, in a way to show the presence of the top management of the company and to show the client that you are there and you care and you are aware of, of the problem that is going on. 
I think that that is a, an important thing to do. It has become definitely difficult now because I have to tell you very frankly, one of the problems that we are facing today is that meeting with clients has become almost impossible. And unfortunately, at least in our industry, still many clients are not uh, familiar with the tools uh, of, for online meetings. So sometimes it's just a matter of you can't meet the customer at all. And of course, this is very uh, concerning on the, on the long term. I would say that, for example, customers with whom you already have an established uh, trust relationship uh, since a uh, long time, many years, is not going to be a problem. But uh, if you have to approach new customers and you have to build trust and relationship with new customers, this is definitely a big challenge. And uh, I don't have a solution for that at the moment. Yeah. It's like... Uh meeting they want to meet by fax because <laughs> that's where the technology is exactly. for a lot of us still right uh, that's very tricky so if we were going to uh, think of say maybe three pieces of advice for someone who is uh, new to japan they've been sent out by their company or they've been promoted to a leadership position in japan and thinking about your 26 years of experience you mentioned what would be some pieces of advice you'd give a new person to japan as a leader Okay, I think that the very first uh, uh, piece of advice would be uh, definitely learning the language. Uh, when I arrived in Japan at first, I uh, was working in a company where Japanese staff had a pretty much good uh, uh, English speaking ability and I felt comfortable at the moment. But then uh, uh, later when I studied the language, I realized that I was missing a lot. I was missing the big part of what was going on. Because the point is that through the language, you understand the culture, you understand the mentality, and you can really put yourself in their own shoes. And when I talk about the language, it's not only the spoken language, but it's also the body language. Because as strange as it can seem to foreigners who come to Japan for the very first time, the body language is extremely important in Japan. I mean, not only talking and listening with your, with your clients, but also looking what they're doing. And uh, sometimes you can see disappointment on their face. And sometimes you can see on the contrary uh, that they are satisfied with what you're saying. Uh, just don't rely entirely on words. Uh, also because as we know, sometimes Japanese don't tell everything that they feel or they think, right? So the body language for me, it is extremely important. And the other important thing I would say uh, try to build uh, a trust relationship with your headquarters and bring, uh, let them understand Japan as much as you can. Create uh, occasions, unfortunately, not in this period, where they can visit Japan and they can understand how Japan works, they can understand the culture. And by doing this, you uh, lower the barrier and you create a common language with your colleagues at the headquarters. Then, uh, uh, it becomes easier to communicate with them. I think this is probably the piece of advice I would give to a newcomer to Japan. Mm. Any other pearls of wisdom there? <laughs> no, I don't That's... think I have any other one. Uh, just, uh, uh, I think personally, I think this is nothing that has to do with Japan, but I'm always curious to, to learn. And even though I've been here 26 years in this country, I never choose to be surprised at some new things that I learn. I think it is an endless process. And... Uh, uh, of course, uh, like uh, many people like yourself, or we who have been in Japan for a long time, we know a lot, but we don't know everything yet. No. So we still have to be prepared to be surprised and to learn that uh, there are other aspects of the Japanese uh, business culture that we have not understood yet, and that we will soon do. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's been another fascinating journey through leadership here in Japan with Lorenzo uh, Shimizu, who, who really, 26 years and uh, three companies in Japan, you know, and different industries, three yes. different industries. So, you know, Lorenzo has done a lot of interesting things here. And I think uh, a lot of innovation going on in his company from what I've seen and very, very, very laudable for that. So please join us for our next episode of Japan's Top business interviews. I'll have to give you a, a distant handshake, Lorenzo. Thank you very Virtual much for joining handshake. me. Thank you very much for Thank joining me. Thank you very me. much for inviting me. Okay, thank you.